There is something rotten in the state of politics in Canada, and it has a lot to do with Justin Trudeau and his Liberal Party. When a man is drowning in a flood tide far beyond his capacity to handle, he begins to thrash around in a state of desperation. Ahead of the October 2015 election, the Conservative Party had warned Canadians that Justin Trudeau is just not ready to lead a G7 country. The warning was prescient, but enough Canadians decided otherwise, and Canada was handed to the Liberal leader, who was no better than a college freshman would be to understand the nature and demands of as complex a country such as ours. Empty of ideas, empty of any understanding of the rich tradition and history of Canada, and arrogantly celebrating his own ignorance when he declared after the 2015 election, Canada has no core identity and is a post-national state. Justin Trudeau continues to flounder in a job he is painfully unfit for. So what does he do? How does he intend to get Canadians to vote for him a second time around when the first time he was just not ready to occupy the chair of Sir John A. Macdonald and Sir Wilfrid Laurier? Well, on the evening of October 2015, when the Canadians gave Justin Trudeau the mandate to govern the country, he exulted. Sunny ways, my friends, sunny ways. This is what positive politics can do. Those were merely words, 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 meaningless words. His sunny ways did not take long to turn dark and divisive. For instance, his handling of the SNC Lavalan affair, his scandalous treatment of Vice Admiral Mark Norman, his rebuke and expulsion of two brave women members of his cabinet, Jody Wilson Raybould and Jane Philpott, from the Liberal Caucus and his embrace of a convicted terrorist, Umar Khadr, are just a few from a long list of his outrageous conduct that make a mockery of his own jubilant announcement of the dawn of sunny ways in Canadian politics. But the worst of Trudeau's conduct and that of his Liberal Party members is reserved for smearing the leader of Her Majesty's opposition in the House, Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives. For this purpose, he has paid out $600 million of hard-earned taxpayers' money to buy out the Canadian media and turn it into a liberal-friendly election machine. Here is, for instance, the evidence. The McLean's magazine and his June cover story. Andrew Scheer has a problem. What is this problem that McLean is so giddily reporting on? The header on the story reads, the conservative leader has left himself open to charges of intolerance in his party. And what is the evidence of the scurrilous attack on Andrew Scheer? Back in February, Western Canadians as a free people in a free country came to Ottawa in the depths of winter to express their dismay with the policies of the liberal, liberal government in continuing to deny Alberta the necessary pipelines to export its energy resources for the benefit of the province and the country. Andrew Scheer greeted the truck convoy of United We Roll to express his support for their concerns and address the gathering of Western Canadians in Ottawa. In any gathering of people, such as those who came to Ottawa last February, there will be found a few individuals who are more vociferous, more angry, more shrill in expressing themselves or espousing questionable political views. 
for the liberal friendly media, Andrew Scheer speaking to such a gathering of noisy protesters in Ottawa and supporting the bread and butter concerns was apparently, in Maclay's description, quoting noxious supporters. As the political stink from the SNC Lavalan scandal spread, the Liberals in the House moved in unison to attack Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives with innuendos and invectives. According to Maclean's, the Liberal House leader, Ontario MP Bardesh Chagar, Immigration Minister Ahmad Hussain, and Democratic Institutions Minister Karina Gold hurled accusations that the leader of the opposition had spoken at a rally attended by so-called white supremacists. There you have it. Without any irony, without any respect for the many degrees of separation between Andrew Scheer and individuals espousing questionable political views that might be condemned as white supremacism, Liberals rose in the House to smear the conservative leader while abandoning any self-awareness that people living in glass houses should not throw stones. Justin Trudeau's lack of self-awareness or a sense of irony is an incurable liberal malady bred by ignorance, virtue signaling, and a liberal-friendly media. Following the massacre of Muslims at prayer in two separate mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand, Trudeau took the opportunity of a horrific crime to rise in the house and slander the conservative for stoking bigotry in the country. Trudeau pontificated. Toxic rhetoric has broken into the mainstream. It's anti-Semitic, Islamophobic, anti-black, anti-indigenous, misogynistic, homophobic, and then added, the problem is not only that politicians routinely fail to denounce this hatred, is that in too many cases they actively court those who spread it. So let us apply the logic of liberal smear against conservatives to the liberals and see how this logic works for them. Vice Admiral Mark Norman, former Deputy Chief of the Defense Staff, is a professional naval officer and a patriot. The treatment meted out to Vice Admiral Norman by Trudeau and his liberal accomplices has been one endless scandal, and the case brought against him by the government in court was eventually withdrawn for being legally indefensible. It was a liberal hatchet job against an honorable officer and a gentleman that would not stand secure a scrutiny in the court of law. In contrast, examine the treatment of Omar Khadr by Trudeau, a convicted terrorist released from a U.S. prison who was provided with an uncontested settlement of $10.5 million for a lawsuit Khadr had launched against the Canadian government for the breach of his constitutional right. In Trudeau's Canada, a convicted terrorist gets a better treatment than a loyal, upright, patriotic individual in uniform sworn to defend Canada in peace and war. What does this say about Trudeau's politics? There is, of course, more. There is the Jaspal Atwal episode during Trudeau's official visit to India in February 2018 which embarrassed all Canadians, irrespective of the political affiliations. The trip was a public relations catastrophe. Trudeau's Bollywood costume performance in India was painfully insulting to most Indians, and India's Prime Minister Narendra Modi did not hesitate to keep Trudeau waiting several days for their official meeting. But it was the invitation on behalf of Trudeau to Jaspal Atwal, a Sikh Canadian and a convicted attempted assassin of an Indian cabinet minister on his visit to Canada to attend an official reception in New Delhi that will be most remembered of that 2018 visit by the Prime Minister of Canada to India. 
At the last moment, Jaspal Atwal's invitation to the reception was cancelled by the Canadian High Commission officials once the news got out to their Indian counterparts. Atwal was disinvited. His presence in the entourage accompanying Trudeau to India was a diplomatic insult to the people of the country he was visiting. Why? It is a complicated story that Trudeau should have known well, but obviously did not, or did not care to take into account. There's a large segment of Sikh Canadians who have supported the separatist campaign in Punjab, India, during the 1970s and 80s for the formation of an independent Sikh state of Khalistan. The campaign of pro-Khalistani Sikhs turned violent and eventually military force was used by the Indian government to defeat and suppress the Khalistani movement. Among the casualties of this violent campaign was the murder by Sikh separatists of Indira Gandhi, India's Prime Minister, in October 1984. But the pro-Khalistani Sikh Canadians continued to support the secessionist movement in Punjab. In revenge for the defeat of the Khalistani movement in India, these Sikhs engaged in carrying out the worst terrorist act prior to that of September 11, 2001. The smuggling of a bomb into an Air India jumbo jet that exploded mid-air over the Atlantic on June 23, 1985, killing all of the 329 passengers and crew on board, was planned and executed by pro-Khalistani Sikh Canadians. Jaspal Atwal belongs to that group of Sikh Canadians who remain active in Canada promoting the secessionist politics of the Khalistani movement. Their activities are a sore point in Canada-India relationship. Trudeau was not six degrees separated from Jaspal Atwal and the people he represents. Atwal and Trudeau have been photographed together since Atwal has been a long-time member of the Liberal Party. Justin Trudeau has been glad-handing with people whose hands, given their politics and support for violence and terrorism, are tainted with the blood of innocent people. What does this say about Trudeau's politics? Given the fact he refuses to put on trial the returning members of the worst terrorist organization in the world, ISIS, for crimes against humanity. Then, there is Trudeau's foreign minister, Christia Freeland, whose grandfather, according to reliable historical records, was a Nazi collaborator in wartime Ukraine. Michael Homiak, Freeland's grandfather supported the Nazis and worked for them willingly and not out of coercion. The Globe and Mail reported on March 7, 2017, the following. Foreign Affairs Minister Christia Freeland knew for more than two decades that her maternal Ukrainian grandfather was the chief editor of a Nazi newspaper in occupied Poland that vilified Jews during the Second World War. There is no six degrees of separation between Christia Freeland and her grandfather, Michael Komiak, nor between her and Trudeau. What does this say of their politics and political inclinations? Shall we ask the same of the liberal house leader but this Chagga, how many degrees of separation is to be found between her as a Sikh Canadian and those Sikh Canadians, likely among her friends and family members, who are, or may be, in sympathy with the pro-Khalistani Sikh Canadians and the political activism that poses a security threat to Canadians and Canada's national interests? Isn't it bizarre? that Trudeau and his liberals want to paint Andrew Scheer and the Conservatives as friends of the so-called white supremacists when liberals continue to be thick with people 
of disrepute, even infamy. It is, moreover, taking a page from one of the architects of the big lie as promoted by Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist. It was Goebbels' view that if a big lie is told often enough, it will come to be believed by enough people. If we were to stoop to their level and use the liberals' own smear tactic, we could rightly say then that liberal minister Catherine McKenna was channeling Goebbels when she recently and gleefully said, we have learned at the House of Commons, if you repeat it, if you say it louder, if that's your talking point, people will totally believe it. This, my friend, is the putrid quagmire into which Trudeau and the Liberals have descended. It is for the rest of us Canadians to save Canada from politically descending any further into the slime and mud where Justin Trudeau and his Liberals find themselves comfortable. <laughs>